Hello, everybody, and welcome to API Days. Um, I am honored to be uh, introducing the first talk of the day. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some excellent talks, and I hope that I can get you all started off um, in an interesting fashion by, by talking about RPC and what that means and how we got to where we are um, and where that is and, and all sorts of other exciting things. So um, to start off with, I think it's worth talking about the difference between RPCs and APIs um, because this is API days and everybody knows what an API is. And some um, APIs are using RPC, um, but not all APIs use RPC. And some RPCs are for APIs, but not all of them. Um, so basically an API, as you know, um, application programmer interface. And it's just a way for developers to interact usually with somebody else's application. And uh, back when I started in this business 31 years ago now, God, I'm old. Um, <clears throat> APIs tended to be uh, uh, libraries that you would link against with your application and they would let you talk to somebody else's data structure um, and uh, and that evolved over time and became sort of networked APIs and so forth. RPCs are um, intended for a different purpose. RPCs are specifically built for uh, communicating between processes, whether those processes are on the same machine or on uh, m multiple machines distributed uh, in a data center or, or across um, geography. And um, an RPC is generally characterized, so remote procedure call, and it's characterized by this idea that making a call to a remote service should look and feel basically identical to making a call to just another procedure or function or method in your application. Um, RPC frameworks and toolkits and, and libraries and everything have been designed to hide that distinction as much as possible. And what I'm going to uh, talk about for the rest of this talk is the history of the um, evolution of RPCs, um, how they started out and how we got to where we are. So um, this actually starts in the 1960s. Um, which is a very strange place to talk about remote procedure calls because in the 1960s, there wasn't really much in the way of networking. Um, most of the computers in 1960 to 69 were big mainframes or mini computers like the IBM mainframe series um, or DEX PDP series. And uh, they there was not a lot in the way of networking. Um, but the first occurrence of something that uh, eventually evolved into what we now know as RPCs was the RC4000 multi-programming system, which was created for the RC4000 mini computer. And it was not designed to make calls over networks because there wasn't really much in the way of networks. It was just designed to allow applications to be built as multiple processes and integrated um, with each other and able to pass uh, messages between processes using a message bus. And that work was done in 1969 and nothing much came of it. Um, nobody's ever heard of the RC4000 multi-programming system or the RC4000 mini computer. They were not particularly successful, but it did sort of kick off the whole idea of um, distributed systems, systems made of multiple processes, and the kind of microkernel architecture of operating systems like Unix and Multics and so forth. Um, so that was at the tail end of the 1960s. And then in the 1970s, um, as ARPANET grew, um, various papers were written on the possibility of uh, creating systems that were distributed across more than one of the nodes on ARPANET. 
and to be able to call a method on a machine in Utah, even if your um, <clears throat> your client machine was in Illinois or Purdue or Case, or there were some very strange places on the ARPANET. Um, <clears throat> and Honolulu, wow. When did Honolulu get on the ARPANET? Um, but yes, uh, people started to write papers about ways of communicating fast enough between machines and processes um, to make distributed systems uh, a reality. It was mostly papers at this stage. There was not a lot of actual work being done on implementations of anything that would uh, be recognizable as RPC or indeed APIs at this point. We didn't get actual implementations until the 1980s. And the first um, available one was called Newcastle Connection. And this was created at Newcastle University um, by researchers, Newcastle University in the UK, because there's almost certainly a Newcastle somewhere in America, and they've probably got a university, but this was the UK one. Um, and Newcastle Connection, um, defined a, a wire protocol. So that was a way of encoding data so that it could be passed across a network connection and a way of marshalling these packets of data from, uh, from a client to a server and then marshalling a response from the server back to the client. Um, that was a pure research project. Um, another pure research project happened at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox, not Xerox, um, typo in my slide there, sorry about that. And they created uh, a functioning RPC framework called Lupine. And Lupine um, actually would look very familiar to somebody working with RPC today. It had uh, automatically generated stubs, which were generated from an interface definition file you would say, this is what I want my interface to look like. And it would generate stubs for um, C at the time. And then uh, you could use the client stub in your client code and it would talk to the server and the server had server stubs. Um, it had type safe bindings and an efficient binary protocol for communicating between two systems. The first commercial RPC system was actually created by Sun Microsystems, and it was called the Open Networking Computing Remote Procedure Call System. Um, it's uh, or ONC RPC. It's also called Sun RPC, and this again uh, defined stubs um, and a, uh, enabled you to make calls on one machine that looked like they were happening on another machine. And ONC RPC was actually used for Sun's network file system, which was the early sort of precursor to Samba. Um, I actually remember using um, NFS in my early career when I was working on SCO Xenix systems with Infomix 4GL and ESQLC. Um, and so at this point, we really got the idea of what a, a remote procedure call framework, a, a distributed system using RPCs looks like. And it is basically this idea. So we have uh, client stubs and server stubs, and then somewhere in between the client and the server, some magic happens and the person consuming the service and the person providing the service and and basically everybody who isn't actually writing the RPC framework itself doesn't have to care what the magic is. It's just magic. Just, just trust it and it will do its thing. And so you have usually uh, an interface definition language um, where you will say, these are my services and these are the parameters they take and these are the types of the parameters. And some of those parameters will be messages. And so you will define your message. So a person message might have a, a person ID and a title, first name, last name, date of birth, and so on. And then uh, some 
automated code will generate the client code and the server code in various languages depending on uh, on your environment and the client stubs generally are usable out of the box so you just say um, give me an instance of that client or use that client's static uh, methods uh, to talk to the remote server and on the server side the stubs would usually um, these days you tend to inherit from the stub and add implementation to it um, in the olden days it would generate kind of an empty file for you and you would fill in the extra code that you wanted to actually um, implement that service and the whole point is that this magic happens in between thing means that people writing banking applications or HR applications or workflow applications don't have to worry themselves with networking code and serialization code and all these sorts of things that are entirely tangential to what they're actually trying to achieve. So by the end of the 1980s, we have some RPC out there. Sun has their ONC RPC, which was um, available for other people to use for other applications as well, but it was not particularly well documented and it was particularly complicated. But the 1990s brought some uh, new advances to programming generally and to developers. And of course, the first of these was object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming had been around for a while. Um, we'd had Simula was the first object-oriented programming language, um, small talk, of course. But in the 1990s, uh, we got C++ and Java um, and those both really opened up the whole world of object-oriented programming. I remember in 1995 switching from procedural programming to object-oriented um, and thinking it was very complicated and going on a two-day course and then finding out at about sort of coffee break on the first morning, no, this isn't actually that complicated at all. But object-oriented programming meant we had a whole new way of thinking about RPCs because in an object-oriented environment, you have one object um, that has some methods and you have another object that has an instance of that first object and it can call methods on that object. And so um, you are effectively uh, already doing a kind of remote procedure call. It's just that the procedure call you're making is into another object that contains its own state. And this gave a great paradigm for people to implement um, RPC on top of because you just create an object and pretend that that object is a remote system and make calls against that object. And this was codified early on in the Common Object Request Broker Architecture, or CORBA, um, which was defined by IBM and Sun Microsystems and various um, industry heavyweights at the time. And CORBA was the first really widely used RPC framework. Um, CORBA had a binary wire format, which was very efficient. Um, so it could encode messages without a lot of overhead and it could communicate between orbs, as they were called. So a CORBA service was, uh, was called an orb. Um, and there was uh, a specification called the General Interorb Protocol or GIOP. And then there were implementations of this specification. And so we had the Internet Interorb Protocol, uh, which did CORBA over TCP, and the SSL Interorb Protocol, which did CORBA over encrypted TCP. And then later they came up with Hypertext Interorb Protocol, which did CORBA over HTTP. Um, which involved using a different wire format because HTTP did not like binary data. And the zipped interorb protocol, um, which just applied compression to internet interorb protocol running over TCP. Um, you can find uh, 
more information on Corba on Wikipedia and on IBM. It is still in use today um, in a lot of the older legacy distributed systems, um, and it's still doing a great job for all kinds of organizations. Um, this is what Corba's binary format looked like. The bits to the left of the arrows, the bits to the right of the arrows are obviously just um, descriptions. So you had the key and the byte order. Um, Corba was very, very, you couldn't inspect a Corba request in flight and work out what it was saying and be able to um, interact with it in any meaningful way. But it was very, very small and it was very quick to serialize at one end and quick to deserialize at the other end. So it made for very efficient systems. So IBM and Sun and various other people were quite happy implementing Corba. And of course, Microsoft um, weren't having any of that. Microsoft in the 1990s did not play well with others. And so they had the component object model or COM built into Windows. And they had a distributed version of that called DCOM and uh, a plus version of that called COM plus. And so Microsoft's story at the time for distributed systems was DCOM and COM plus, which was fully internal, fully proprietary, no open standards at all. And uh, nobody outside of Microsoft shops really used it. The 1990s continued though, and the 1990s were a fertile decade for technology. An awful lot happened because of course, in 1991, Tim Berners-Lee put the World Wide Web live for the first time. In 1993, it became sort of more widely available. Um, and uh, he defined the HTTP protocol um, and uh, the web started to grow. And so there was suddenly a new way of communicating between machines over a wide area network and indeed over the entire internet. And as the World Wide Web grew um, and was adopted by organizations, we started to develop this idea of a service oriented architecture or SOA where right up front, we would build applications to be distributed across multiple machines to give us better performance, better scaling characteristics, um, more resiliency. We could have multiple instances and so forth. And because we wanted this to run over the internet, um, we needed uh, an internet friendly format for our RPC calls. And so SOAP was invented, the simple object access protocol and SOAP um, became the, the core of RPC for most of the rest of the 90s and most of the early 2000s as well. Um, SOAP largely ran over HTTP. It is possible to do SOAP over raw TCP and various other um, protocols, but it was largely run over HTTP um, and it was XML based and uh, it had headers and body, and it didn't make a lot of use of much of HTTP at all. Almost everything to do with SOAP was encoded into the SOAP message. It didn't really use HTTP headers. It didn't really use HTTP uh, URLs um, to differentiate between operations. Um, it built on top of XML. XML was all the rage in the 90s, um, hugely verbose format where every field is both preceded and appended with the name of the field. Um, and uh, XML is a couple of books encoded as XML, but this was far too vague and un, uh, undefined, ill-defined for the SOAP people. They thought this needed a lot more namespaces. And so this is a SOAP envelope wrapped around the XML. Um, and this is what you would use to send a SOAP message um, from a client to a server. And SOAP systems generally um, exposed web service definition language files or WSDL files. And you could use a WSDL file to generate a client for a SOAP service for whatever system you were um, working with, whether that was Java or .NET or Python or something else. Then we hit the year 2000, 
and the Y2K bug. And I think part of the reason the progress slowed down towards the end of the 1990s is that we spent two years chasing through all the legacy code and redoing all the dating coding um, from two digits to four digits so that all the computers in the world wouldn't just catch fire at midnight on December 31st, 1999. And we did a brilliant job and none of them did. And so everybody the next day went, well, that was a big fuss about nothing. Um, so yeah, but then the 2000s started and in uh, the year 2000, we actually got the XML HTTP request. Um, and you won't believe who invented XML HTTP request because it was Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft invented it specifically for Outlook web access and built it into the current version of Internet Explorer. And then it was moved on into um, other browsers and became a, a long lived standard. Um, in the 2000s, we also had uh, Douglas Crockford defined JSON, JavaScript object notation, um, which was defined in 20, 2001 and wasn't actually standardized until 2013. And the great thing about JSON was that you could um, decode an object just by passing it um, using the JavaScript parser. And the bad thing about JSON was that would also pass any actual code that was also passed in the JSON. Um, and so it turned out that that was a bad idea. In the year 2000, we also got REST, um, Representational State Transfer. And this came from a paper by Roy Fielding at the University of California in Irvine, um, the architectural styles and the design of network based software architectures. And this was a hugely influential paper and caused an awful lot of people to say RPC, that's the worst thing ever. Everything should be rest and documents and puts and posts and gets and so forth. And so we spent the next 10 years trying to crowbar various things into the rest architectural style and sending our messages as JSON and then trying to pass that JSON using the HTTP standard and figure out a meaningful way of expressing that we wanted to send an email or mark an invoice as paid um, or pay an invoice um, as just the basic create, read, update, delete operations that are available to an HTTP API. Um, meanwhile, while REST was happening, Microsoft created the Windows Communication Foundation in 2006, and WCF was designed uh, similarly to Corba to allow application developers to just build their business logic and not worry about how it was communicating with other applications or services. Um, it included WCF NetTCP, which was a binary protocol, super fast, um, but was proprietary to Microsoft. They did actually open it up and try to get other people to implement NetTCP, but everybody else just went, eh, no. Um, but WCF generally communicated using SOAP. And if you were a .NET developer, it was the main way you would expose SOAP services or consume SOAP services that were written maybe in other languages like JavaScript. WCF it did abstract away all the complexity of how messages were encoded and uh, how they were um, passed from one machine to another. It hid it all behind uh, some XML for which this is the schema. Um, it was insanely complicated. And if anybody has ever had to configure a WCF service using XML, then I share your pain. I did not enjoy it. In the 2010s, things changed again. We got um, AWS and Windows Azure started to come along. We started to think about uh, our servers more in terms of cattle than pets. And uh, we started to try and architect our systems as microservices, um, distributed very small services across a lot of machines. And this was uh, put into early practice by Google um, and various other large internet companies. Um, these microservices led to the container ecosystem, Docker, and the ability to deploy um, services wrapped with all their runtime dependencies nice and easily. We got Kubernetes um, for the orchestration and scheduling of these containers that made building microservices um, very straightforward. And on the web side of things, we got WebSockets, 
which meant that browsers could maintain a persistent connection from the client to the server, and things could happen in both directions there. And in this microservice environment, where there was an enormous amount of traffic um, traveling between an enormous number of usually fairly small machines, HTTP APIs and SOAP APIs and REST APIs really didn't make a lot of sense. And so at Google, they created something called Stubby. And Stubby was an RPC framework that went over raw TCP IP, and it was a binary encoding for the messages um, that was uh, later became protobuf. Stubby was super fast, and it was internal to Google. Um, and then HTTP2 came along, and um, with Stubby, most of the framing and everything was done inside the framework itself. When HTTP2 um, arrived, which was itself based on Google's SPDY, SPDY protocol, um, it made it possible for people to um, let something else take care of the framing. And so gRPC was born, and you can find out more about that at grpc.io. gRPC, um, again, has a binary format. It uses protobuf. It is uh, incredibly fast, and it runs over HTTP2. So it can run over the open internet just as well as it can run between machines in a Kubernetes cluster. And with gRPC, because there was less proprietary hard work in it, Google decided to make it open source. And so with gRPC, we have an interface definition language. Um, we have the protobuf definition language, which allows us to define messages and services. And we have the uh, protobuf wire format. And this allows us to build much more um, performant systems um, and distribute microservices without worrying so much uh, about the um, encoding and decoding of messages and the passing of messages. So compared to WCF, um, WCF compared to gRPC is really comparing 2006 to 2020. WCF was trying to achieve the same things, um, but it had uh, its wire formats were SOAP and uh, NetTCP. It was only for C Sharp and VB.NET. It only ran on Windows. Um, it only interoperated with other platforms if you used SOAP. Um, and comparing that to gRPC with its uh, efficient and fast wire format of protobuf um, and its support for C++ and Java and Python, it's just general cross-platform support, um, its ability for all these platforms to interrupt with each other through gRPC um, was a much more modern framework for doing RPC. Um, gRPC, here's the languages that gRPC supports, C++, um, basically everything. Regardless of what you want to program in these days, um, you will be able to find a gRPC library for it. So that brings us up to where we are. Um, that's the story of where we got to with RPC. Right at the moment, if you want to do RPC, gRPC is the best thing out there. Um, it's easy to use. Once you get the hang of it, it's so good that Microsoft have actually stopped doing WCF and have advised everybody to move to gRPC instead. Um, I am creating a tool for Visual Studio that will actually take your WCF application and automatically translate it to gRPC, um, which is available from the website I'll show at the end. So that's where we are um, in the near future. Uh, well, we're expecting HTTP 3 to come out any moment. Um, this is uh, HTTP over UDP, um, which will avoid some of the problems that HTTP 2 has running over TCP. Um, you can find out more about that in this excellent HTTP 3 explained book um, at that web address there. Um, it seems reasonable to assume gRPC will start to run over HTTP 3 um, once that becomes standardized and widely available. There's also something interesting called RSocket, which I've been playing with lately. Um, RSocket is essentially a networking protocol um, exposed as reactive streams semantics. RSocket itself is not an RPC framework. It's a much lower level than that. Um, it's just a way of passing streams of data between machines. Um, 
and it was created by Netflix and they open sourced it in 2015. But there is an RSocket RPC framework that runs RPC on top of the RSocket protocol um, that has a lot of promise, um, especially for different kinds of RPC where you are um, requesting a stream of data and then processing the stream and keeping it open for a long time. Um, gRPC will do that. gRPC fully supports streaming, but our socket um, has a different approach and uh, it's interesting to see what they're doing there anyway. So that was my story of RPC. I hope that was uh, interesting and informative for everybody. Um, I had a lot of fun researching it. Uh, it's been interesting to see how things are circular and how we started with Corba and its binary protocol and then went through text and then back to binary again with gRPC. Um, I will now hand you back to your host and uh, it, ask you all to stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so some questions that we've seen on the side, uh, like when would you advise to use gRPC? For what kind of, what's the sweet spot for gRPC today? Um, there are two real sweet spots for gRPC. Um, the first one is when you are communicating between two machines, um, normally between two services, excuse me, <coughs> um, rather than between a client and a backend service. Um, when it's internal to your uh, data center um, or to your cluster or whatever that might be, um, RPC, gRPC in particular, is by far the best option for communicating fast um, and safely between uh, systems. The other area where it has a lot of um, potential is for mobile applications, um, particularly mobile games. Um, a lot of those use gRPC simply because the bandwidth usage um, compared to HTTP API calls is so much lower. Um, and so, uh, yes, for a lot of mobile applications, gRPC makes more sense for their communication than HTTP APIs. But if you have a public API that you want other people to be able to consume, that generally should be HTTP and uh, JSON, either a nice REST hypermedia API or something like GraphQL um, yeah. is, is more much, appropriate Mark. for that. Thank you very much, Mark. We see a lot of uh, congratulations in, in, the, in the chat, so you will be able to answer to everybody. Thank you for having opening uh, this conference. It was a great 